Good evening and welcome to today's uh, Committee of the Whole. We have one item on the agenda and that is a presentation on the Public Records Request Program Update. And I will invite Christy Rowland to come up and kick us off. Good evening, I'm so happy to be here. Christy Rowland, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you for your time this evening. I am only going to say a few short things. Uh, number one, I could not be prouder of the group you're about to hear from. Uh, as you know, Jason, <laughs> every, every Monday night, does great work for the city, but his entire team are on the front line and you're stewards of city resources and records, and I could not be more proud of the work they do. I'm also very proud of Jason's vision he has for his team and what he's done to reshape his team, the structure and the resources he's gathered to equip his team with the ability to respond to exponential growth that you're going to hear about in public records requests. And one last thing, a thanks to you for your support of our requests that we've brought forward over the last year and a half and your continued support of this program. With that, have I stretched long enough, Jason? All right. <laughs> I'll hand it over to the expert. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks everybody. Uh, as, she, as Christy mentioned, thank you, Christy. Uh, I'm Jason Seth, I'm the city clerk. Uh, with me is Melissa McCain, our deputy city clerk. We're here today to provide a, uh, an update on our public records request program and its impact on the city. So, Jason, I yes. apologize. Um, we don't have anything on our screen, so we can't really see your presentation back there or up here. Okay, one second. Just have the logo. Because he's also the IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did not, I did not, I can go grab my computer if that's the. the, the can you see it now? No, we're still seeing the logo of the city. Yeah. <laughs> I could just go get my computer if that's the answer. Nope, it's... Uh... How, about... How about now? Nope. Nope. Here we oh, go. Oh, 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 oh. Promising. Now it's black. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, thank, hey. You, thank, you, thank you. I told you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jason. Sorry, public, the, for the interruption. Okay. Judith, can you see it? It, it looks like she can see it. You yeah, step maybe it just yeah. turned out okay. there. Thank you very much. Okay, Sorry. I think we're good to go. Sorry for the delay of game. Mercury is in retro, retrograde. Yes, it is. Council lots, Member Albertson. Lots of technology <laughs> upgrades the last year. And uh, I'm not an IT person, so... <laughs> Thank Good job. Oh, thank you. So here we go. So uh, this program, the Public Records Request Program, supports the city's business plan uh, by meeting service demands and providing high quality customer service, right? We do this by developing and maintaining uh, programs that enhance the experience for requesters, uh, collaborating with partners such as the Renton Regional Fire Authority, uh, as well as State Patrol, Valley Communications, and each of the city's own departments. And we also do this by auditing the program and providing periodic reports to council such as this and to the state of Washington. Our agenda today is fairly brief. We're uh, gonna give a brief history of the Public Records Act, brief history of JLARC, which I'll explain what that is, uh, the reporting requirements, uh, 2018 through 2021 metrics, trends, impacts, and opportunities, and finally a summary. And so, yeah, Public Records Act passed by Initiative 276 in 1972, passed with 72% voter approval. Uh, the courts interpret the act to uh, apply, uh, well, really to promote disclosure, right? While directing agencies to apply redactions and exemptions narrowly. So, the, so essentially what that means is that uh, we cannot redact or exempt documents unless there's a state or uh, other like federal law that allows us to do so. Otherwise, we, we disclose the record. Uh, and local agencies are liable for violations. Penalties can be as high as $100 per day per record uh, for non-disclosure. Next is uh, to the JLARC, which is the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee. It was established by the 2017 state legislature 
Uh, the JLARC committee was established by the legislature in 2017. It requires agencies providing more than $100,000 or spending more than $100,000 to report public records information to the state. It applies to essentially all levels of government and required that JLARC standardize definitions for the metrics that are reported. Uh, reporting began in 2018 uh, with only the second half of 2017 being reported. So the reports are due in Jul on July 1st of each year for the previous year's uh, information. Uh, Renton does meet the requirements to submit the report. And uh, just as a matter of information, we, su we supply that report to council as an information item uh, after we get confirmation the state has received it. And so these are just some of the metrics, uh, but uh, total number of requests received, a number of requests closed within five days. And I can kind of explain that. So we have, uh, legally, we are, we are required to provide a response to uh, requesters within five days. That response can be either provision of the records. Uh, it can be, go ahead. <laughs> we can point them to, if the record is electronic, we can give them a link to the exact record they're requesting. We can tell them we have no records, or we can say we are reviewing records and we will have um, an installment of records to you by date certain. So we tell them by 5 p.m. on a very specific date. Those are the four requirements of our five-day um, obligation. All right. And then we also... Uh you know, the average number or and median days to fulfill requests, the number of requests by, by type, uh, the average estimated staff time, estimated total cost to fulfill requests, and we'll talk about that in a, a future slide, and then expenses recovered. And so uh, Melissa will be explaining the uh, 2018 through 2021 metrics. And as I mentioned, we don't have 2022 yet, but we do have some anecdotal data because uh, the report's not actually due until July of this year. So. <clears throat> so with the implementation of the JLARC reporting requirements, and because the city exceeds the reporting threshold, the city is required to submit one report each year. And that report is a combination of city clerk and rent and police records division, uh, public records data. As explained in slide eight, there are several data points we are required to report on each year. Utilizing the reporting module within the GovQA platform, that is the city's online public records request portal, we are able to extract the JLARC data for each metric, such as the data presented here on slide 10 and then the information coming up on slide 11. The data presented here in column one, the total number of requests received and closed, each reporting period is considered the baseline data for each report. So as you can see in column one, the number of received and closed fluctuates. Um, you'll notice that in 2020, uh, we, we closed more than we actually received, and that was due to staff being able to close the request that carried over from 2019 into 2020. So even with COVID, we were able to complete and, and close out quite a few requests um, during that time. Using the baseline data again and the total hours spent by staff dedicated to fulfilling public records requests, which is metric 10, the JLARC system automatically calculates the average hour to fulfill each request as shown in column two. So you'll notice in the beginning, column 2018, we were about three hours to fulfill each request. 2019, 2020, we did pretty great. We two hours per request. 2021, we jumped to about seven hours per request. Um, that has to do with the complexity of the requests. Um, technology also is another big thing as technology changes, we bring in new technology, we have to learn that technology. What type of records does that technology create? How do we get those records? And then how do we produce them? Okay. And, and if I could clarify too, it's not just our technology that we use to actually manage the request. It's technology the city, uh, like teams, like MS Teams and the Office Suite and getting the records out of those uh, programs uh, that we have to learn how to do that. And we, you know, we work collaboratively with the IT department to do that. But it's a it's a steep learning curve when you ha haven't been using it before. And COVID obviously pushed us into uh, uh, more and more technological uh, solutions to be able to do hybrid meetings like tonight and uh, that kind of thing. But it does create additional records. 
So, so column three on this slide is the data also collected by the JLARC reporting system using the baseline data with the addition of the city's total costs incurred in fulfilling public records requests, which is metric 11. With this includes staff compensation supplies, such as USB flash drives, mailing costs, and recurring software, software licensing. So we're able to tie in our GovQA platform to that cost of fulfilling public records requests. And as you can see, our costs recovered, um, they fluctuate, but as more records become digital, that's less cost we will recover. Um, I think that in 2020, the cost, when I calculated it, that was for a request we fulfilled pre-COVID. Um, and there were a few big requests that we we sent out on flash drive. So that was our, our $26, but we, we didn't recover anything for 2021. In 2021, the average staff hours to fulfill a request increased, and we anticipate that number to continue to rise. As I previously said, this is based on the complexity of the requests and new technology used throughout the city. Before we move on, uh, are there any questions? Madam President, I'm, I'm not totally sure it's clicking with me as far as the recovered per request in total, just when I look at the numbers. Uh, can you break that down a little bit? I mean, when what's the eighty-four dollars is what? Let's just say two thousand eighteen. The eighty-four dollars is what exactly? That is what we, the city, recovered from requesters. So in twenty eighteen, there were probably were a lot of paper records sent, mm -hmm. and so we were able to charge the fifteen cents per page to um, make those records available to the requester, and and so we were able to collect it that way. Um, and then again, flash drives. If there were electronic records um, in the police department, there were um, case files. If there's a lot of photos and video, then they would send those out on a flash drive. And so we can recover that cost of the, the flash. The actual cost. The actual cost of the flash drive. And Plus then the, the, the mailing costs as well. And then the per request, which is the larger number, like in 2018, it's $134.68 per request. So that is the total cost. That's staff salaries for everybody that is tied to re reviewing and responding to requests. It's not just Melissa and I, it's no. also uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay. people down in CED that help uh, pull files, permit files and things like that. It's police department, uh, their, their staff, it's... Uh, we, we go down to about um, if the lowest we go is 5% of their time. So if we have staff, say public works, transportation for traffic camera video requests, there's an in individual there that spends about 5% of their time each year fulfilling public records requests. So that's the, the culmination of that. And then the total is actually everything together. Yeah, that's yeah. everybody's salaries and all and, the costs and in the software costs. and the software because we have i think the recover was throwing me a little bit wasn't yeah quite sure what that was. okay thank you it'd be safe to say that's like the revenue right rather than recovered it's like the revenue it's basically oh, we what say we're recovered making. because we don't believe we'll ever have any <laughs> actual revenue <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it is uh this is a service we provide to the public uh, mandated uh, essentially by state law and so it's uh and and it you know, it could be called a, an unfunded mandate technically, but uh, it is it is something that we have to do. And so we, uh, you know, we try to provide the best service we can, even though uh, graciously you all budget for us so that we can do this uh, and do it, I, in my opinion, really well, so. Any other questions? Okay, okay thank you. <clears throat> So the inform information presented here is a combination of requester types from requests received by the city clerk's office and the police department. Again, utilizing the reporting module within GovQA, we're able to identify the top five requester types as shown in column one. And column two identifies the top five businesses and column three lists the top five individual requesters. So for 2022, the top five business requesters, um, number one and two, of course, are Police, rec you know, they're always requesting police records. So LexisNexis, Metropolitan Reporting Bureau, and then Geico as an insurer. AEI Consulting and Partner Engineering and Science, those are on my side of the house. And those are for phase one site environmental studies. Um, they're representing customers that are looking at property within the city and, and they need those, those reports done. Um, top five individuals. Number one, it was listed as a, as Jake Leland. Jason will go into a bot request uh, later on in the presentation. Um, second top requester, uh, Mr. Mengus, and then 
the that's a combination of police and city clerk records. Um, number three is strictly police. Uh, number four is uh, land use city clerk side. And then uh, number five was also police. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna take over again. So slide 12, we're gonna, some of the impacts, right? So some of the uh, impacts and uh, issues impacting the program, right, um, are, we can start with the, the volume of requests continues to increase, right? So this year alone, in the first quarter, we we saw over 200 requests. The clerk's office generally gets uh, between 680 and maybe 750 uh, requests a year. Uh, the police department get the majority of the requests. They are uh, usually, you know, uh, looking for their own uh, court case or their uh, incident report or police reports, that kind of thing. And so they get thousands of those requests. Uh, the requests we get are generally apply citywide or uh, are very complex, uh, sometimes dealing with personnel issues or dealing with uh, uh, even political issues sometimes. And so we work uh, really hard to manage those, but they, like I mentioned, are uh, we're just receiving more and more of them every year, including the uh, uh, this year where we're up over 200. What Do you know what we're at? 222 regular requests through the system and 27 through miscellaneous and the miscellaneous are just onesie twosie things that people come directly to us rather than using the system so yeah we're close to 250 requests at this point of the year so we can predict that we're going to be close i i think we're going to be close to 900 requests uh just in the clerk's office this year and so uh two is the complexity of the request right and so one recent request involved reviewing more than a hundred thousand emails uh, so each email has to be read, analyzed for content, and and then determined whether a portion of it must be redacted or exempted uh, from disclosure. And so uh, email uh, email is the retention for emails based on the content of the email. It's not based on the type of record that it is. And because of that, we currently store all emails. And so when we do a search, and if somebody's searching for uh, Seahawks, let's say, uh, we could, uh, you know, especially in a good year, we could, we could, <laughs> we could have thousands and thousands and thousands of emails that are technically responsive, uh, maybe not uh, responsive to what they're seeking, but responsive to their request for all records regarding the Seahawks, for example. Uh, and so uh, we do not have a process in place to review every single email as it's received for retention. But we do hope to rectify that soon, and, and I'll speak more to that uh, a little later. Uh, three is the body-worn cameras. And so, as it turned out, we, we did not receive a large uptick in requests just for body-worn cameras. But what we did receive, or did happen, is that almost every request the police receive now also includes a request for the body-worn cameras. And so it's complicated their mission of providing these uh, uh, records uh, by basically uh, causing more time, more staff time uh, to review. Uh, I think we did a study where... Uh, there is a um, cost study. Um, it was 15 minutes and 34 seconds, I believe, of video, body-worn camera video. Um, and I sat with staff and we, to redact out the images from that that needed to be redacted, it took us two hours and 20 minutes and 19 seconds just to redact the video, because again, it's a frame by frame redaction that did not include any of the audio. Right. And so, so, and we had to do that as uh, the, the actually coming up next week is the adoption of the new fee schedule that includes uh, an ability to uh, receive some uh, uh, cost recovery, I'll call it, for staff time for reviewing those body-worn cameras. It's uh, currently set at 64 cents a minute. And so, you know, it took three or four staff two or three hours, and we're uh, legally only authorized to uh, recover about 64 cents a minute. Uh, Madam President? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I'm trying to understand uh, the request of the body cameras if someone want to ask specifically they have to ask for an incident they have to ask for a day for a how how the request of a a, a video 
I think is my question, <laughs> is done. So the, the body worn camera legislation, um, when that was implemented is very specific. The request has to contain um, several key components of the request. So they would say, oh, I was involved in this incident at this date in this time. Um, these were the people there. I, I am the victim. I want that body worn camera video because I'm part of that incident. I am entitled to that. Um, but we were getting requests that are just because it's it's there. They're just saying, "Oh yeah, I want all case I want all case reports about this area and date and time. Oh, and I also want all body worn camera for anything for anybody that reported or responded to any of those cases." So, thank you. Did that help? Yes. It, okay. It, it does. It, it does help a lot because I was very confused, and I think the public is confused with that, and they think that is like the public request. You just send oh. Anything that relates to this word, please send me the request. And and I don't think they understand that is a legality issue that they just cannot request the video of this day in this location at this time just because I want to see a closer encounter how did it happen. Well, you know? <laughs> right. If they do request that, then we we have to pretty much redact most of it mm -hmm. out depending on what the incident is. And so. Uh, it's, it can be requested, but it uh, takes us a long time to process that request. And so it, that's part of uh, why we believe that the number of hours per request will go up even more in 2022 uh, because we've implemented that program. And so I think the 2021 numbers, did that include some? It I don't had remember. started a little bit because the pilot oh, yeah. program had started. Right. So there was a pilot program, mm -hmm. but uh, it's fully implemented now. So we do believe it will... Uh, increase the numbers for our response time uh, per step, per request. Uh, I just, if I may, I'd like to clarify, are, are you saying that any member of the public can request any body camera, body worn camera footage for anything at any time? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for clarifying because I was misunderstanding mm -hmm. that. So when you say that you will edit the 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 footage, uh, we redact. The the re what is that? What redact. Means? redact so, um, the, the the video. Um, say say um, it's a say it's a, a fatality traffic collision. Okay. So um, there's probably several officers. So. Um, the fact that it's a fatality, and again, Stephanie, hopefully Stephanie's here because I'm, I'm flying by the seat of my pants, but uh, <laughs> it'll. Uh, what we're going to do, what we would do is staff, PD staff is going to review that video frame by frame, and the things that would be redacted would be um, when an officer, say, pulls the victim's driver's license and they're reading it, we need to redact that. When you see the video, when the video shows of the individual involved in that fatality, we need to redact that. When the video, when the individual is transported from the vehicle to the back of the ambulance, everything in the back of the ambulance needs to be redacted. So we're gonna black out the screen, blur the screen, do whatever we can to protect that individual and all of that information. When the officers are in their vehicles, they have an MDT screen um, when they're doing calls and whatnot. So there's some of that information is also to be redacted again. Um, so there's each- And there's uh, several officers generally on yes. a call. So we have to <laughs> review all of the- uh, camera footage yeah so, so thank you i want to, to thank you because yeah it was very confusing for me at the beginning and it's still as you can see i just misunderstood you and now thanks to the question of the president clarifying uh but i think i'm not alone on this one you know right. you know so, right. so so thank you and something that's come up um with police staff um they're you know the team down there is a phenomenal team what they we've been doing is we collaborate a lot on ways to become more efficient for them to try to help them uh with their records so one of the things that we're looking at and i've reached out to GovQA, is a modification to our portal where right now it just says there's a box you can check everything to request every record body cam video is on there uh one of the ideas is to change our portal to reflect an another local jurisdiction where it's two separate items where the the request form, as the, the legislature has stated, a body cam video must request these items. We're looking at breaking that out to help PD staff and help the, educate the requester on how what they need to provide us if they're going to request that type of record. Does that help too? Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, 
so another impact is uh, employee turnover. So while you know some of us love doing this work, uh, some do not. And so uh, we get a lot of people uh, come into the job, they do it for a while, and then move on because it is it is tedious. It's very time consuming kind of work. And so uh, we have had some turnover in our office. We've there's been uh, vacancies in the police department, uh, and so. Uh, we do our best to retain these uh, quality analysts, but it is, uh, it's just not a very glamorous job at times. And so, uh, so there is some turnover. And then finally, as we mentioned previously, the cost recovery. Uh, there's almost no cost recovery for the amount of money it costs the city to maintain this program. But with all that said, we, we are... Uh, we do have some program improvements and accomplishments over the years. And so uh, one of the main things is uh, just uh, using process efficiency principles, right? And so like lean and some of the things that even in our own department, we have uh, Ryan uh, Spencer, that is our uh, organizational development manager. He's, you know, using the tools that he provides to the city helps us even lean out our pro process and our programs. And so we're really... Uh, looking forward to working with him to uh, figure out ways to improve this program. And we've done some of that already. And then software, using software. And then uh, obviously the budget, the budget appropriations helps us. And, and I'll explain a little more on that. And so we've implemented LaserFiche. LaserFiche is our city's uh, uh, enterprise content management system. And it's essentially a system that... Uh, is like a records deposit uh, repository, but it also can be used to create uh, forms and uh, uh, basically process improvement through technology. And we're one of the things we did is automate automate the redaction of some collision reports and then post them online. And this, uh, so what the police do when they get these reports, they'll go make sure the report's online. And it's just started, so it's in its infancy, but it is online currently. It is up and running. Uh, but they will double check and make sure that the report's there, and then they can send a link directly to the person instead of having to go find the report, uh, manually redact the report, and then uh, post the uh, report to the requester. Uh, now we can, uh, as the law allows, provide a link to that report. Uh, police department believes this will reduce pr processing time for hundreds of requests each year. Uh, the GovQA, so we, GovQA is our software we use for uh, the portal, what we call the portal for receiving public records requests. Uh, it's, it uh, can analyze software and identify, or analyze the request and identify bots. And bots are uh, requests. Do you want to speak to that a little? So a bot request, um, what the legislature has, it has classified it at as a request that is submitted instantaneously. So we had a requester that we looked at all of the requests this person had submitted and in about a year and a half period, it looked like they'd submitted about 1100 requests. And as we took a deeper dive into their looked, we were able to look and see that they were submitting one request every second. So as we took a look at all of that and we went through it, I worked with the attorney's office and we were able to determine that that was actually a bot requester. And so what we did is I worked with PD, said I've identified these as bot requests. I went in and created um, denial letters for those requests and we closed those requests for PD records based on that statute and utilizing the GovQA system to actually identify those requests and how they were coming in. All right, so we were able to close 131 requests uh, la uh, in 2022, and we hope to uh, kind of continue. Uh, continue to do that to close more requests this year. And uh, the bot is identified, the state actually tells us what a bot request is, and they have to be submitted within so many seconds of each other and that kind of thing. And so uh, we use the software to help us identify which ones actually met that criteria so that we can legally uh, deny and close those requests. And then... Uh, Finally, as another improvement with the budget, uh, uh, thankfully you all authorized a uh, new position in our department and two new positions in the police department. And then we had a vacancy. So just last week, we filled both those positions. We filled, in the clerk's office, we filled our vacant public records specialist position and our uh, limited term public records analyst position. And so we're hoping to get them uh, up to speed and uh, and kind of rock and roll so we can get this uh, uh, program, you know, moving on. And, and 
Same with the police department. They were authorized two new positions, and they're in the process of recruiting those positions right now. And then, uh, you know, about those impacts, you know, we did talk about a lot of impacts, but some opportunities that we see are maximizing the use of our technology. So continuing to find ways to have LaserFiche help us provide records, redact records, and uh, and uh, post them online. The more records we have posted online, the more we can just point to them and uh, close these requests quicker. Uh, we can also audit the program. We can determine whether that's actually working or not. And... Uh, and determine its impact on customer service. For me, that's the whole, even though, you know, these, they're, uh, we receive so many requests, we, I do feel this as a customer service program and that we are working diligently to provide the records as quickly as possible, uh, given the, you know, the funding, the staffing and the technology we have. And then uh, hiring new employees allows the, the manager Melissa, uh, more time to develop new process improvements and efficiencies to update our uh, some of our city policies and uh, to provide citywide training because every employee uh, that here at the city is impacted by this program in some degree. And then program managers will also have time to determine uh, the staffing needs. And so I think we made a promise that we would uh, come back to council uh, with before that two years is up to determine whether we need to continue that uh, position uh, or or not. And so uh, this will give us that opportunity. All right. Okay. Summary. I'll just read it. So we've received. Thank you. So uh, there. Are, let's see. No, nope. so city clerk. So we've seen a fifty percent increase in the number of requests. So, like I said, I think we're going to see about nine hundred requests this year, which is a substantial increase over last year. Uh, we do fulfill about seventy six percent of all requests uh, within that first five days. Uh, we work collaboratively with the police department, other city departments, Valley uh, Communications, State Patrol, uh, and uh, the Rent Regional Fire Authority. Uh, to get these requests fulfilled. We have a unique relationship with the Renton Regional Fire Authority because of the fact that uh, up until 2016, they were a city department. And so we have a lot of their older records. And then when we get requests for current records, uh, we work with them to uh, either provide the requests or we, you know, we, we work in tandem with them to make sure the requests are fulfilled. Uh, we are enhancing the program through automation and additional employee training. And, and I believe that we are excellent stewards of Renton's records. We've had zero claims uh, on, you know, in, I, I don't even know how long. And then we are currently archiving emails, text messages, social media posts. We do, uh, and that also is uh, thanks to uh, recent budget appropriations. So we do appreciate that. And then the use of laser fiche to preserve our archival and essential records. And so some records have to be kept permanently. And, uh, and so that, that software program allows us to do that. And it, uh, as I mentioned before, I think it will allow us to um, really like push the program forward as far as being able to automate uh, more of this. And, and automation isn't meant to, you know, take away any kind of jobs or anything, but to kind of the mundane tasks, right? Make those uh, just kind of happen and then allow us to get into the more uh, weeds of these kind of really complex requests and not get tied down by the volume of requests that we receive. So, and that is our presentation. Any, any question? I have a question. Um, other than the bot requests, are there any that you can just flat out deny as being superfluous or are there any? Any, any other type? any other type of, um, you know, duplicative or? Unfortunately, no, there is, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, technically requesters are not allowed to use these uh, for, uh, for uh, commercial purposes, right? They're not, but we don't have any kind of way to know what they're doing with the records. And so it's, uh, you know, we might warn them that, you know, and send, when we send the uh, response to them, have the RCW explaining, you know, what they can and can't do with the records. But uh, there's no way for us to enforce anything like that. 
And so, uh, so unfortunately, no, there's, we just have to respond as quickly and, and professionally as we can. Madam President. Yes. Jason, uh, you, you guys did a great job. Thank you, Jason, Melissa. Um, I know a few years ago we were having a conversation with the legislature around nuisance public records request. Are we still seeing a high number of nuisance requests? Does that number come down? Where uh, are we at with that? Do you want to speak to that a little? Or well, I think the I think the bot request solution was a result of nuisance requests, but I, I, we we. We just um, we we address and assist every customer and, that sends us their request. And I, I I do believe there have been some <laughs> cases where the courts have uh, ordered a requesters not to request, uh, and and we do get notification when that happens. There's a recent injunction I think obtained from Department of Corrections right. from an inmate. Yeah. Um, and so there, those are few and far between, but that's, that's what I was actually, that was more of the oh. lens that I was looking through. Cause I know we used there, there, I remember this being a huge issue probably yes. about five years mm -hmm. ago in the legislature about nuisance requests and how they were coming through. And I know at the time we were seeing a fair share of nuisance requests. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if. Yeah, if there's a court injunction and we're notified, uh, then uh, then we can deny those requests. But otherwise, we we just try to fulfill them as quickly and efficiently as we can. Thank you. First, um, Mr. McCurvin and then Perez. Thank and you. And then Vaughn. And then Alberson. <laughs> Bring it home. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first, I just want to... Um, I like commend you on the zero claims. Uh, that's to me the big takeaway because that cost figure I imagine could be a lot higher were that not the case. Um, the question I have is regarding the automation because to me it seems like fight technology with technology if you're getting these bot requests. Uh, are we talking as far as like AI technology or something that could assist or not nothing that futuristic? And, and if not, is that something that's being looked at? I mean, that could as it assist with redactions, identifying. I mean, obviously, I think we still want the human element of control, but is there a way that that could be expedited? So, technically, uh, currently, no, it's a it's a manual process to create a workflow to identify the records, and then uh, it's a process called Quick Fields, where if the forms are standardized, we can look at a particular field on a form and say, oh, this is Social Security number or driver's license number, and redact it out, um, and then that gets posted online. Right? Uh, has the conversation occurred? Uh, yes, but you know about AI, but we are nowhere. I mean, we've. You know, just kind of right. like, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if this could happen? But yeah, uh, but not, we're nowhere, uh, we have not really gone down that road. So. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for both of you for your presentation. Um, it was 2017 that we, we we went to the legislature to ask for help because many cities, the vast majority of the cities, we were receiving the same request, and it was obviously we need a cry for help at that moment. In 2018, you came and presented to us uh, a, a, some of the solutions, and when I'm very happy and I commend you is that today's presentation is way more positive than when we see uh, in 2018, which the your department was getting overwhelmed by this. So I, I, I commend for the steps that have been taken to provide the, the request that, 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 you know, that legally people are, um, have the right to, to have, and also in the name of transparency, we don't have anything to hide. Right. But, uh, but I'm very happy to see that now the department has been taking expense to be m more professionally, uh, I don't want to say the word professionally, but it's got to do with professionally uh, respond to this request, but at the same time in a level of efficiency that the department will not be not doing other things just by having to reply to this request. So, so thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, we were really trying to push like just how uh, quickly we can respond to requests efficiently, uh, professionally. And uh, and you're right. It is about transparency. Uh, this was an initiative led by the people in 1972 to say the government doesn't get to choose, you know, which records belong 
you know, in the public realm or not. And so, uh, so we take that to heart. We're a third, we're a neutral third party for the city where, you know, we really don't take sides. We, they request the records, we provide them as legally as, as we can. You know, so. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Melissa and, and uh, Jason for your presentation. I had a two part question. But um, Council Member McIrvin beat me to my second part of it. So my first part, because I haven't, um, again, just commending you guys for all the work that has been accomplished and continuing. Um, I've interned and volunteered at Harborview just doing records. And so uh, not there now. So that's, that's probably why. So coming to my first part of the question is the staff and congratulating you on having the both positions filled. Um, what is the time frame in terms of the uh, staff from starting point to um, really being getting the flow and then helping with all the records, right? Is it usually you see the 90 days, 30 days, and then the other part was the automation of what was the timeline? So for the, the staff, we got really lucky. We hired a, uh, a woman who worked at the Valley Communications Center who had experience with GovQA, who had experience um, providing records and uh, knew the, the law. They they do, uh, you know, different types of records over there than we have, and we have uh, more departments and that kind of thing. And so, uh, in my opinion, for her, you know, she should be up to speed within probably 45 days, uh, maybe less. Uh, the other gentleman we hired from the city of Clyde Hill who uh, had done public records for them, and uh, his role as a public records analyst is to learn how to do bullion searching in our email system, learn how to um, like uh, the law, right? Like get into the, the uh, legal aspects and, and how to um, basically help Melissa with the more complex uh, records. Some of the ones that deal with personnel issues um, can be very complicated, um, you know, former employees, those kind of things. And so uh, we, we hope to have him up to speed in about 90 days. Um, and really the, the purpose of the, these two, in my opinion, these two employees will help, uh, like I mentioned previously, uh, provide that space uh, for Melissa to get into what we call Q2 space and learning and, and, and uh, managing the program and not the requests. And that's really where I want her to be. I want her to be able to manage this program so that we can take automation to that next level. We, you know, we had a, uh, a work session. So luckily enough for me, the enterprise content manager works for me. He is a software IT expert and is, a, is assigned to my office, where, you know, is a direct report. And so with his help, we're, uh, reviewing basically every process in the city clerk's office, including public records, and trying to find ways to automate all of those processes. And then once we do that, and he has a kind of foundational knowledge of how to automate basic processes, uh, we plan to push that out to the department and then later to the throughout the city. And so uh, we are, in my opinion, on the cusp of, of doing something really great for the city. And it's just, uh, you know, just just like we don't even know what we don't know yet and so we're uh hoping that uh, with his expertise and with our knowledge of the records program you know that we can really push this to the next level uh because it is important and it is uh something that we uh take great pride in doing so thank you so i'll say i appreciate that you folks do this because I would definitely be in the camp of not having fun with this at all. Um, maybe a, a silly question here, but when you look back at the metrics and the received and closed, I know you mentioned, uh, you pointed out the carryover from 2019 to 2020. Are we to assume that uh, the difference between the received and closed um, on each of the other ones is just carry over into the next year or is there some aspect of ones that just aren't closed or what just carry over it's the carryover due to the complexity of the requests okay thank you uh yeah we have some requests that take several months to close sometimes uh a year and a, a half year and a half on one and okay. so uh they're just very complicated very there's a lot of uh detail that has to go and and uh analytical kind of 
uh, review of the documents to determine whether the requester is authorized to have those or not based on state law, you know, and so uh, it just takes time sometimes, especially when, you know, we get some of these requests, 100,000 or more emails, and every email has to be read and reviewed. And so, uh, you know, we just, we just take, it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time until you get through it. I repeat, I would not have fun doing it. <laughs> and, to, and to be honest, the I don't know if you noticed, but the pictures in the PowerPoint were not of records and boxes on show. <laughs> they were pictures from around town. And so I thought that uh, that would be much more entertaining than looking at boxes <laughs> on shelves. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say as someone who um, has a lot of experience in records requests as well, and I've said this to you before, I want to say it just for everyone to hear. Um, I have received every excuse under the sun from fires to cyber attacks to just records not being retained. And I never once had to make a public record request in Renton because there was so much access just simply online. And those avenues that you've taken to reduce the work for, work, uh, workload and to increase accessibility is incredibly valuable and well appreciated and I see you and I just really appreciate all the work you have done because rent is probably one of the easiest places to get a public record. Well, we appreciate that. We work collaboratively with, with every department to make sure these records are posted online. So I Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. So I will close by saying I was going to comment on how stunning the pictures in your presentation were compared to some of the other presentations we get in here, and I really appreciated that. Um, and I also want to say that I am, uh, uh, as a retired senior finance systems analyst, I salivate over process improvement. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's That's right it. in my wheelhouse. And, it's what I did for a living. So and so, you know, as being part of the new executive services department, it really that's our that's one of our main focuses in the department is, yep. you know, and yep. so and it's trickled down to the clerk's office. And so and we try to take it to heart. So you can I, 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 I will share a little something that I was known as the Telly Savalas process improvement. <laughs> <champion>. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very kindly. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the spirit of customer service that you bring to what is clearly a, a, a detailed and, and challenging job. So thank you very kindly. And with that, we are adjourned.